And y'all could be seated. Welcome home. It's so, so good to see you guys. That is going to be a phrase that you're going to hear a lot moving forward because it's really representative of this new season that God has us in as a church. He's so faithful. He is so good. Guys, I know that it's hard, and we're in a hard season, many of us personally, but also in, in, in the world, and it's very easy to get just focused on what is broken and what is absolutely nuts in our lives. But here's what I will tell you. He's faithful and he's good. And man, if there was ever a time we needed a place to feel like we're home, is it now? Right? Isn't it now? And so I just, man, God is so good. God is so good. And our heart truly is to be able to provide a place here that feels like home. And so I met a new couple from California. Don't hold that against them. I told them we would not do that. Um, but they're from California, and, and they said they just happened to see our church passing by. I hear that so often. And, and they just thought, man, there's something compelling us to come in. And she said, the moment we walked in, we felt at home. Only the spirit and the presence of God can do that, right? Isn't that just amazing? And so, man, I hope that you feel at home too. I really do. You'll hear me say this a lot as well, but basically I want to lead a church that I would want to go to if I wasn't on staff. You know what I mean? If you're going to, if, if I'm going to make the sacrifice to show up into a room and to hear some hyper bald guy yell on a microphone, and, and I want to feel like it's worth my time. Now, I can't guarantee you myself, but what I can tell you is this, the presence of God over, it, it just it like covers a multitude of wrongs, okay? And, uh, I, but I, I would want to come to this church because I really love you guys, and I love worshiping with you, and it's an honor, it's an honor to be your pastor. And so, man, um, you guys over the summer were so generous with our Best Foot Forward campaign. We raised $50,000. Um, to be able to make in capital investments and, and upgrade. And so because of just the, the, the current economy and the way things manufacturing are working, you will see surprises every single week when you show up and updates and upgrades. And so you're going to start seeing those things. And obviously, if you look at our playground, it doesn't look like a, a, a prison yard starter kit anymore. It actually looks like something that you would want to put your kid in and don't have to give them a tetanus shot to be able to play in there. Um, and so as a parent, those things matter to me and so um, man that's just one expression of many that we're going to be able to do over the next couple of weeks and months to be able to make our place look as beautiful and inviting as possible and so so glad that you're here um, by the way we also have hats t-shirts all sorts of stuff and so we have order forms out on the front desk if you want to wear your your swag or your grace point swag but here's what's kind of cool we've kind of we've customized it and so if you remember when I preached on who so who's got your six do you remember that that sermon Three people in here, okay, all the rest of y'all pagans were still at Disneyland in the summer. Anyway, we got a Who's Got Your Six t-shirt, so we're excited about that. I'm excited to wear that one. Anyway, with all of that said, um, I'm going to pray one more time because I'm really, really excited to be able to share this word with you this morning. And so I, we need God to breathe on it. So, Father, thank you that you have a place set aside for us that you say we, are, we can be, and be invited into, and that's home. Home is where you are, Jesus, and we just want to be where you are. So we invite you here. You're welcome here, Jesus. And God, I'm praying that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would testify to your word today. And Lord, may we leave aware of your love and able to express it in a way that blesses you and honors your name. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus once said in Matthew, when the Son of Man comes in his glory... Okay, not if, but when this happens. And all the angels are going to be coming with Jesus. Then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence. And so he's speaking like at the end of the age. He says, this is, this is what we're all going to experience. You, me, you and us. I mean, all of us, right? We're going to be there and we're going to be gathered in his presence. And he, at that point, will begin to separate two groups of people. Now, this is Jesus talking. And I don't understand all of it, but I do understand enough to be sobered and go, oh my gosh, Lord, may I be a sheep, okay? And you'll see why in a second here. All the nations will be gathered in the presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates a sheep from the goats. And what he's going to do is he's going to take the sheep and place them at his right hand and then he's going to take the goats and put them at his left hand. Jesus continues to say, then the king, who's the king? Jesus is the king. He's the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the shot caller. He's the one that uses the earth as his footstool, according to scripture, and he's ironing things out. Here we go. 
he says, he will say, come you who were blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. This idea that God is creating a kingdom for us to be welcome into. This is the ultimate welcome home. This is the moment that we've all been longing for, a place where we can belong, that we can be whole, that we can be restored and be in the very presence of God and see his face and worship at his throne and be there as a family where every tear, according to scripture, will be wiped away. Every crooked path will be straightened out. Every injustice done against you answered and responded to and settled. And we will be sanctified. We will be whole and we will be in eternal eternal presence with God himself. That is home. This is not home. That is home. And Jesus is talking about what's going to happen for many of us. This is the ultimate welcome home. But then he says something that's interesting to me. And maybe you know this passage, but listen to it with fresh ears because he says, for I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and look at what it says next. And you invited me into your what? Your home. Jesus is saying this. He's saying this to the sheep. And all the sheep are like, okay. And he goes on to say, I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me there. Now, I absolutely believe that Jesus is talking about meeting the physical needs of those around us. There's no question about that. But I also believe that since we are mind, body, and spirit, that he's also talking about other needs that we can't see with the physical eye. I'm talking about spiritual needs. I'm also talking about mental needs, being able to meet these types of needs in addition to the physical needs. Often when we meet a physical need, it affords us a place at the table to actually meet a spiritual need. Have you noticed that? Jesus draws this direct line. Jesus does this. And he says in so many words, when you reach and bless and welcome these folks who are broken, sick, hungry, thirsty, rejected, despondent, those who are in bondage to addiction, those who are in bondage to all these things that the world has heaped upon them, when you welcomed them and served them, Jesus is saying, I take it personal. I actually take it so personally that you were doing those things to me. What? Think about that. Then these righteous ones will say, those who are the sheep, they were, they're going to say this, they're like, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry? When did we feed you? Like, I would kind of want to know. Like, what was that time, Jesus, that you, I did that, and you were like, yeah, oh, that was good. Thank you. I'm refreshed. Because I would want to know, right? Well, we're going to be asking this question because it seems that the sheep were unaware at the time that they were serving and feeding the hungry and meeting their needs, spiritual, physical, and mental, that they were not even aware that they were doing it to Jesus. I said, well, when did we do that? It was so customary to these people and these sheep that it was just natural. They didn't put a lot of thought into it. Why? Because we love people. We love people. That's, that's the mark of a, a Christian is their ability to love the unlovable and serve those who don't deserve to be served. And so we're going to go, when did we do that, Jesus? When, when were you hungry and fed you and thirsty and give you something to drink? When were you a stranger and show you hospitality? When did we do that? We should have paid attention more, right? When were you naked and we gave you clothes? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, you did it to one of the least of these. When you did it to the ones that you thought, oh, they're just, you know, they're just the least. They, they don't have anything to bring. They don't drive a nice car. They don't have a job. They're kind of annoying. They, uh, they're this, they're that. They've made some bad decisions. They're irresponsible with their money. All, whatever the least of these is, and then we all have a qualification in our own minds and hearts of what the least of these would fall into this category. But when we overlooked and looked past our own judgments and our own biases of how they got to that role and that position in society, and we still met the need, and we still loved them, we still fed, clothed, met the needs, all the rest of these things. When we did that, something happened because Jesus said, when you did it to them, you were doing it to me. Y'all blessed by that? Are y'all challenged by that? But then the king will turn 
to those on the left. Let's not forget about the goats. He says, this is a quote from Jesus. Take it up with him. We make a big deal about Jesus. He's the boss. Okay? So I really am going to come up with a sermon series called He Said It, Not Me. <laughs> And talk about all the hard things in the Bible that, that are hard to preach, but this is one of them, and I, and I have to preach the Word of God because I want to be faithful to it. In context, he says, however, there's another group, and he will say to the goats, away f with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons, meaning salvation is, is a gift from God. But here's the reality of it. Without salvation, there's damnation. That's what Jesus is saying here. So there really is some pretty high stakes related to what he's talking about here. It's not about Jesus being our homeboy. It's Jesus being our savior and our only hope. And so he goes on to draw a line and he says, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked, you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and, and, and in prison and you didn't visit me. Jesus says, and then the goats will reply. And say back, Lord, when, when did we ever see you hungry? In other words, they're like, no, we would have bought into that. When did, we, we didn't, where were you? He said, well, they, they wanted to respond back, or when were you a stranger? When were you naked, sick, or in prison and did not help you? It seems that they were operating under the idea that they knew the shepherd and was doing his work. And they were under this impression that they were doing the right things. But he says, you didn't do the things I asked you to do, though. You did right things, but you didn't do righteous things. And there's a difference. He says, I tell you the truth, when you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you refuse to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. There's two paths here that Jesus is presenting to us. And I got to be honest with you, it's scary. And it should scare us. It should really kind of bother us because it forces us to go, okay. I vote the right way, I pay my bills, I try to be a nice guy, I try not to kick the dog, I try to do all the right things, but here's the thing, man. Are we a goat? Are we a goat con congregation where we have the form of godliness but deny the power within it? Do we praise God like James talks about with our lips and yet curse our brother with the same mouth according to James? Do we watch people on television who are sick, desperate, destitute, irresponsible, filthy, they're the problem with society, this is why our nation is in decline, and when they, we see them coming across the border, or we see them burning down a city, or we see the neighbor who won't cut their grass, whatever it is, fill in the blank. And I'm not making a statement for one thing or another. Do you see how polarized the devil has made us? Even talking about it, I could feel the, the, the temperature in the room change. My point is this. I'm not advocating for anything except what God says we have to do and should be. That's it. Take your pick. And if I really do my job, nobody's going to be happy with me. So I'm really waiting for that day, and maybe we're closer to it than I thought. But here's the thing. Jesus seems to draw a hard truth here. And Jesus is saying, though, that when you meet people where they are and attend to their needs, when, when you invite them into your home, your home, our homes, he said, you did it to me. And so when we do welcome someone at their lowest, when we do welcome someone and serve one who's the most overlooked or the least deserving of a help of any sort, Jesus said, oh, when you, you served them, you did it for me. Thank you. I take it personally. It seems Jesus places a greater value, at least in this passage, on serving people at their worst than celebrating them at their best. Right? I mean, it's one, I mean, look, the world will applaud you when you're winning. But you ever been on the other side of things when you've gotten a reputation that's jumped on your back, that you've made some knuckleheaded decisions? And then you got yourself in a financial situation and then you throw a divorce in there and you throw this, that, and you got a bankruptcy and you got a little, you know, a little bit of a habit of this and you've just fallen out of favor. The world doesn't cheer those people on. No, they chew you up and spit you out. And sadly, too many people who claim the name of Jesus jump on that bandwagon too. You don't belong here anymore. You're not one of us. Christians are the only ones that will shoot their wounded. That's the devil. 
and the devil is a lie. You see, we should cheer and celebrate God's goodness in our lives. We do. We celebrate those things. But I don't know about you, but when I'm in a spiritual rut or I'm in a cycle of addiction, maybe for you, that's your situation, or maybe we just forget who God says that we really are, it's when I need someone to tell me something, and it's a little phrase, David, in spite of that, welcome home. Home says you belong here. Home says it's not the same without you. Home says you're loved, you're safe, and you're not alone. That's home. I want to lead a church that I want to go to. And if I'm going to go to a church, it better feel like home. And I need to be loved the way I walk in and let the Holy Spirit do the work of making me look like Jesus and have some brothers and sisters who love me enough to walk with me and show me how to clean the dishes and how to behave, how to act right. And let it start feeling like a family. And I will tell you something. I'm very honored to say that I really do feel like our church, you guys, you make it feel like home. You really do. But there's more because there's more. Does that make sense? We can't have a big thing flashing up on our sign that says we love San Antonio and they walk through the door and they don't feel that love. We're going to have to just go, come on in, you weirdos. Come on in, people who don't deserve. Come on in, come on in, come on in, come on in. And Jesus says, oh, that felt good. Thank you. You did that to me. What you may not know, actually, is this building used to be <laughs> a custom home builder room and a warehouse. It used to be a, a showroom for, and a custom builder. And so basically, this used to be, I guess, their storage area. I think some offices were over here. And so you could come in and, like, customize your home. And so there's probably rolls of carpet, tiles, some desks. That's what this was. This was a place where people would come and go, what kind of home do I want to have? And what kind of home and memories? This, wants, this is my forever home. I want to plan it for, right, HD, HGTV fans, you know what I'm talking about? You see... While, amen. But this was only a building that housed a home building company before it became a home. What made it a home? Not because we changed the sign on the outside from Billy Bob's Custom Builders or whatever it was. No, the reason why it became a home is because you showed up. It's because you showed up. You see, the church is not a building. The church is the body of Christ living within the family of God. Amen. That's who we are. So let me just be the one to tell you this morning, welcome home. Welcome home. This is God's heart for us. But let's be honest. Now, this is going to be a progressive series, okay? So we're not just going to be talking about how to reach and the downtrodden, although that is a theme throughout. But here's the, it, we got to start at a certain place because the truth is, is some of you don't even know where home is. Maybe you were invited by a neighbor or a friend or you're watching online from your own home. And you're just like, man, what is it's what he's talking about? I've longed for that. I've longed to find a place to belong. And I get that. But how do you know how to get to the home if you're not invited into it? If you don't belong there? What, you can't walk in a home without the keys. You get shot. Right? Here's the thing. The context of relationship determines your ability and how you walk into a house. For example, my son David Jr., who does not live with us anymore, he's married, he has his own home. But here's the thing, he's got the code to our front door. He does not knock still. Son, I kind of wish you would sometimes, because it freaks me out. I'm like, who is this man with a beard walking in my house? But it's Dave Jr. He doesn't knock. He doesn't do anything. He knows the code. He doesn't ask it. He sits down on the couch. He opens our refrigerator. He eats our food. <laughs> Grown man making his own money. Why? Because it's home. It's home. However, if you got that ring doorbell, and no offense, if you're one of those uh, solar panel salespeople, we love you and we, you need Jesus too. But here's the thing. What happens? What happens? When that ring doorbell captures the, the solar guy, what do we do? Number one, we do not answer the door. Right? And don't act like you do. Don't answer the door. We take a screenshot of their face and send it out on the Facebook neighborhood page going, he's back. Don't open the door. What's the difference between my son and the solar sales guy? Relationship. One belongs, the other one does not. Does that make sense? We really do love the solar sales people. It could be anything. All right, so relax. They're expensive, but we'll just move on. But it's hard to know <laughs> where your home is if you've never been to one and been to it. 
What, you just walk in anybody's house? No. You have to belong. How many of y'all have had seasons where you know where home is, but you feel like you've burned too many bridges to be able to justify your ability to walk back through a door of that house? Some of us are there. And unfortunately, some of us feel that way here, and that's why some of you are watching online, because you don't feel like you belong here anymore. But then there's those who, we've grown up in church. I'm a professional churchgoer. I was going to church nine months before I was born. My attendance record could shatter anybody's in here. I'll probably, well, okay. So here's the thing. So I've been going to church for a long time. Y'all need to be so glad I just edited myself. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, I lost my train of thought. I was like, <laughs> uh, so when you live in your house, and, and I, I just went back to my old neighborhood on Friday, and I felt like the Lord said, go back to my old neighborhood on my birthday, and just kind of, and just, I don't know, just relive some moments. That's where I accepted Christ, and I just did some reminiscing, and it was really sweet between the Lord and I, but um, when you live in a house for a long time, it looks more and more custom to your needs, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But over time, some of these houses that are on our streets, these people have lived there since I was a little boy. So they've lived there for like 40 years. And it's so funny, they got it exactly the way they want it. Their car parks in the same spot of the driveway. They, they, you know, and, and you go inside the house, the remote control always goes on that table. You know what I'm talking about? Where everything over time is just specked out for your needs, your desires, and the way that you like them. The issue is what happens though when you have a couple of people that move into that house and don't know that the remote control belongs there, or maybe they walk in and they use the plates, but they don't clean them. They use the bathroom and then they use the last bit of toilet paper and don't replace it on the roll and they put it on the wrong way. Like communists do. Here's the thing. <laughs> I'm, t I'm, I'm feisty, and this is going to go one way or the other, guys. This morning, I'm just telling you now, forgive me. I, I'm, at, I'm, I'm speaking like I'm living in my home. But here's the thing. Sometimes we go, man, people need to start learning how to wash the dishes. We, don't they understand the remote control belongs here? Don't they understand, right? And so what happens is within the church, we go, don't they understand this is my seat? This is my chair. I sit here every Sunday. Don't they understand that when you come to church, you tuck your shirt in, you wear a belt. When you come into church, don't be, be this is what I'm saying, don't put your cigarette out on the, on the pavement outside and come in reeking a smoke. It's not how you act in this house. And what I'm here to tell you is, no, that's exactly what Jesus is saying. Broken, jacked up, unlovable, marginalized, dismissed, People who can't get it together, he's like, I want them in the house and I want them messing it all up because that means they're here. Okay, there's this scene in Luke 15. And Luke 15 opens up by saying this to illustrate the point that God is giving you right now. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners. This is how the story starts out. Tax collectors at the time of Jesus were people who were like the bane of society. These were people who were terrible. They used to shake their own countrymen down and rob them using the name of the government. They would charge them taxes, but overcharge them and put the rest in their pocket. But they're like, dude, you're my next door neighbor. I'm like, it is what it is, pay the piper. And they would drag widows out of their homes and throw them in prison if they couldn't pay up. They were terrible people. Terrible people. These were the people that would, in our society, would be drug dealers or terrorists or people who eat at Whataburger voluntarily, whatever it may be. <laughs> Do you see how serious this is? It's an inside joke if you're new here. But the notorious sinners were also present. And this made the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law complain that Jesus was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. Or where would people eat together at the time? They would eat in homes. So these sinners would invite Jesus into their house and they would feed him. It was an exchange of intimacy. It was a beautiful thing. And the Pharisees, the religious people who have the remote control on the table the way that they like it, were kind of getting upset by all of these people associating and mingling in this situation. They're like, does he even know who he's interacting with? In other words, you've got the rule keepers here, but then you've got the rule breakers over here in close proximity, and Jesus right in the middle, 
Let's see what happens. Jesus, understanding what's going on here in the dynamic, he chooses to tell a couple of quick stories. He says to everybody, he says, if a man has lost a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go search for the one that is lost until he finds it? The relentless pursuit of the Holy Spirit. Some of you have been the one that gets lost. And God never gave up on you when you were running as far as you could, when you were in the darkest of places, associated with the darkest of behaviors, and you were just not who you know God made you to be. God never stopped pursuing you. He kept the bullet from hitting you. He kept that syringe from killing you. He, he stopped it when you grabbed the gun to end your life. He intervened, intervened, intervened. Why? Because Jesus in Luke 19, 10 says, Jesus came, the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. Amen. And I was lost and he found me. This is what Jesus does, guys. And he goes on to say, and when he has found this sheep, he will joyfully carry it somewhere. What does it say? Go to the next one. And when he will find it, I don't know where we're at, but when he found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and his neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. And Jesus says this, he says, in the exact same way, you could draw a direct line, in the same way, there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents. Now let's talk about this word for a second. Repent simply means to change your mind. So repent. Let God change your mind so you can see things the way that he sees them so you can live in the fullness of his life that he has for you. But when our mindset is wrong, our lifestyle will be reflected in that. And often there's brokenness and pain and issues because we just have wrong thinking, not the wrong God. So the point is, when we repent, we change our direction. Everybody say change our direction. So over the 99 others who are righteous, and haven't strayed. So Jesus is saying, when that one is found who left the sheepfold and he comes back, heaven throws a party. That's what he's saying. The picture of the good shepherd leaving the 99 who were awesome, doing all the right things, opening the door on a Sunday morning for guests, serving, doing all the right things. He loves you. This is not a, you're bad and you're a Pharisee if you, if you try to honor God with your life. That's not the point. But the point is, is that while you matter to God, so does the one who doesn't, when we look at them, doesn't think does. They all matter to the point where Jesus says, y'all keep the show running. I got to go get this lost sheep. I can't sleep until I find it. Man, the truth is Jesus was looking for each and every one of us before we even knew we were lost. While we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us, is what Scripture said. A sheep really doesn't even know it's lost until it's found. Did you know that? A sheep just thinks he's living his best life. <laughs> until the wolf comes and devours him, or he falls off a cliff. Jesus goes on further to illustrate this point. He goes, suppose a woman for example, and she has 10 silver coins and loses one, won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? Jesus says, and when she finds it, she's going to call on her friends and her neighbors and say, oh my gosh, rejoice with me because I found my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. What does sinner mean? It feels very pejorative, right? Sinner means less than perfect. Now you guys are awesome, but ain't none of us in here that are perfect. So we're all sinners by definition. It's, it's an archery term. That's what that means. And so when we see sinner and we see the word repent, we think about the dude with the sign that says get saved or microwaved, turn or burn, right? And we're, uh, he's, you know, but here's the thing. You're just less than perfect. Allow God to change your mind about how you see yourself so that you can walk in the fullness of God. That's it. Sinner, repent. And there's a celebration when that woman finds a lost coin. Let me share with you a story and personally about what this particular parable did something in my spirit. So I was living in Colorado at the time. I was raised in San Antonio. I'm a San Antonio boy, lived here for most of my life. But there was a four-year period of time that I was in Colorado doing ministry. And I was just feeling uneasy about where I was in my life. 
Are you noticing a theme here in my when I tell these stories? There's always like this existential something. But I just want to, guys, I'm not, I'm not awesome, but I want to be in God's will. I don't want to waste my time. You know what I'm saying? Just chasing my own desires and my own ideas of what I think God wants me to do. I really want to know if I'm in God's will. And so I, f- I was just wondering, Lord, am I behind your will or am I too far ahead? Have I gotten too far ahead of you? I just need to know if I'm in the center of your will. And I'm praying this as I flew into San Antonio. Well, the Lord said, David, I will tell you when you go to Friedrich Park and I want you to hike and I want you to pray. Now you go, oh, is he one of those weirdo preachers? No, Jesus says, my, when I speak, my sheep know my voice and they follow it. I know my father's voice. I've been, I've been praying and talking to God for years, and I know when he talks to me, and that's what he told me to do. And you're about to see that this proves to be true, and not because I'm super spiritual, but because I, I know the Lord's voice. So I go to Friedrich Park, and I'm on the, on the, I'm decided to take the long trail. And it's, the Friedrich Park is beautiful, by the way. I highly recommend it. It's over across the Dominion, and it's just beautiful out there. And so I was hiking, and I was praying. And I'm asking him the question, Lord, am I behind your will? Am I too far ahead? I just need to know. I don't even need to know what the answers are. I just need to know if I'm on time. That's it. And as I'm praying this, and I'm in my own world, and in my own life, and in my own problems and challenges, there's this woman with this little five-year-old, six-year-old boy holding hands about 20, 30 feet in front of me. Well, we're on the back part of the, of the, of the, the park, okay? So this is not, you have to really kind of mean it to get to where this part is. And I see them, and we're the only people in the park. I had the whole park to myself until this situation showed up. And I saw them, and I went, oh, my gosh, she's going to get vibed out. She's going to think that I'm here to eat their faces off. She's going to want to mace me, like, oh, no, we're going to get killed in the park, or whatever. And so I did everything that I could to <clears throat> try to get her attention, let her know that I'm here, don't turn around, you know, don't, don't, whatever. So I said, hey, do you mind if I just kind of pass by you guys? She's like, yeah, sure. And so she held her son by, right, and I walked by. Lord, am I in your will? Oh, I'm freaking out. I don't know if I'm behind or I'm up ahead. And then all of a sudden she goes, sir. I turn around. I was like, yes. She's like, I'm going to mace you now. No, I'm just kidding. She said, sir. <laughs> she said, um, I've lost my keys, my car keys, and we don't know where they're at. And I, I walked back to her and I said, well, you lost your car keys. And I'm thinking to myself, if you lost your car keys out here, you just need to call AAA and just get it over with because you're not going to find them out here. I mean, it's acres and acres and acres of trails, and they go everywhere. And she's like, oh, I, I know. She's like, oh, my gosh. The problem is, she's like, I said, do you know anybody here that you can have someone bring keys? She's like, no. She said, we're here in town. We just moved here from San Francisco. She said, um, no, I don't know anybody. I said, well, here's what I will do. I'm going to keep walking. I'll keep hiking. If I see your keys and I find them, I'll meet you down at the bottom of the trailhead and I'll give them to you there. I'll meet you in the pavilion. I said, but you may want to think through what we're going to do to be able to get that car open and get some other keys. Cause I don't know. So then I start walking. Oh, Lord Jesus. But all of a sudden my prayer switched. And then I felt this tremendous urgency in my spirit to pray this particular parable. And I was like, God, Oh, and then the Lord began to show me. He's like, David, this woman needs to know that I am looking for her. And then I, as I felt that, I began to pray. And I was like, well, thank God. She's got uh, she's to know that the keys are in her. She's got to know that, that found the keys so she can understand that you are involved in that. And, you, and I began to, right, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. Guys, I'm not even joking. I'm walking up the trail, right? And then I'm like, God, please let me find these keys. She's got to know that you love her. And this is the way in which she's going to be able to hear it. I just felt it so strong. Guys, I'm not joking. I'm walking. I'm like, please let me find the keys. And right, my foot was pointing one inch from a set of keys. I was freaking out, guys. And you would have been as well. Because I'm like, am I looking at keys right now? Or am I freaking, am I losing my mind? I picked him up and I started making my way back to her. And then when I saw her, I couldn't wait. I was like, hey, you looking for these? And she's like, how? I said, let me just tell you something. And then I became Pastor David Martin. I was ready to preach. You think my sermons are long now? Wait till something like that happens. Dude, let me tell you. So I said, listen, I said, here's the thing. This is not about your keys. She's like, well, what do you mean? I said, God sees you, and he loves you, and he put me on this trail 
for you to lose your keys so that I can find them so I can give them back and tell you in the same way that we were looking frantically for your keys, God has been doing the same thing for you. She begins to weep. She begins to share. She said, I'm from San Francisco, and I just moved here from San Antonio. My son and I moved as far away from his father as possible because he was abusive, tremendously physically abusive. We had to run for our lives. We don't know anybody here. We're staying in a hotel. We have no one to call. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. Melanie, do you remember me sharing that story years ago? So we, you know what I did? I held that little boy's hand. I held her hand, and we prayed, and I shared the gospel with her. Well, guess who found out whether or not he was in the center of God's will or not? You see, everything that we do in the name of Jesus always is a reciprocal blessing. You cannot outgive God. God, you bless someone else, God's going to bless you twice. It's not because we give to get, it's because that's who he is. Jesus said, yeah, man. And I share that with you because... The same applies to anybody in here who feels like you can't be found. You're too far gone. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. He said, a man had two sons, and the younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. In other words, Dad, I don't want to wait around for you to croak. I'd just rather for you to give me all the money right now so I can go live my life. I'm a grown man, but I need your money, right? Isn't that a classic like, young man thing to do? Dad, I don't want to live under your rules anymore, but I really do need 20 bucks for gas. Right? That's what he's doing. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. And so a few days later, his younger son packed up all of his belongings, moved to a distant land. There he wasted all of his money in wild living. So all that his father had afforded him, he blew it. He ran through grace like it was nobody's business. And he's now in a situation because about this time the money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. Y'all catch that? He starts getting hungry. I think this is where some of us deep down inside, we go, yeah, that's right. You made your bed, now you gotta sleep in it, hot shot. You dishonored your father, you blew your money, and now this is where you find yourself. Serves you right. And I think Jesus would say, actually, you've got it wrong. Because he's there and he's starving. He's made this bed. He deserves what he's getting. So what he does is he pursued or he persuaded a local farmer to hire him. The man sent him into the fields to feed pigs. Jesus is telling the story to Jews. The idea, you couldn't even touch a pig. If you did, you were considered unclean. This young man is feeding things that are unclean. Some of you do not feel like God can love you anymore because you are in a distant land spiritually and you are feeding unclean things and keeping them alive. And it could be bad behaviors. It could be addictions. It could be a, the, the way you manipulate people. You're just feeding death and uncleanliness. But this young man became so hungry because, guys, you can feed pigs, but they're not going to feed you. And so we can feed the addictions, we can feed our bad mindsets, we can feed our behaviors that are destructive, but they're not going to feed you and they leave us hungry, do they not? And that's what he's finding out here. He's feeding pigs and he looks at what he's feeding these pigs and they're demanding of him to give him. And he goes, if I could just eat some of what they're eating, maybe I could live. But no one gave him anything. You know why? Because that's how the world operates. That's the law of the world. You lose, you're out. If you win, you're good. He's lost. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, man, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I'm going to go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me back as your hired servant. So he's preparing this little speech for his dad. So he returns home to his father, but while he was still a long way away, his father saw him coming. Why? Because he'd been looking for him probably walking out on the front porch day after day going, will this be the day my son comes home? And I think that maybe you're here or watching online where God is looking at you going, will this be the day you come home? I've been waiting for you. Come home. Welcome home. 
Filled with love and compassion, this father runs out to his son and embraces him and kisses him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer even worthy to be called your son. And the father doesn't even pay any attention to it. He says, quick, bring the finest robe out of the house. Put it on him. Get a ring for his finger. Put sandals on my boy's feet. Kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for the son of mine was dead and now has returned to life. Yes, and he was lost, but now... Now he is found. So the party began. You see, the lost young man learned something I want to share with you. You see, guys, the same road that you took and we take to leave home is the same road that leads back. The direction determines your destination. This is where he repented and he changed his direction. He changed his mind about what the world could offer him and he started making his way back home. He repented, he changed direction. And so while many of us can relate to that kid, because we're that kid, while many of us can relate to that and can get excited about it, not everybody does. Because meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working, and when he returned home, he heard music, dancing, and everybody partying, and he asked a servant, what's going on? They're like, your brother's back, and your father killed the fattening calf, and we're so excited, and we're celebrating because of his safe return, right? And the older brother was angry, and he wouldn't even go in, and his father comes out of the party and says, all these, his son goes, daddy, all these years, I've made sure that the remote control stays right there. I've tucked in my shirt, I've worn a belt to church right? I voted the right way. I tithe 10%. I've done all the things. I serve a kid's ministry. And yet this filthy sinner, he says, he says, dad, have you forgotten what this kid has done? He goes on to do a resume of how rotten his little brother is. He says, listen, I've done all these things for you and you never even gave me a feast. And yet the son comes back after squandering all your money and he's hanging out with hookers. That's what he says. And you celebrate him like he's done something real special by bringing this fattening calf in? His father said, look, dear son, you've always been with me and everything that I have is yours. Why are you worried? We had to celebrate this happy day. Why? For your brother was dead. He's come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. I'm going to share a sentence with you or a statement that I almost deleted out because I already know what it could sound like. But the Lord said, keep it in because it's going to challenge us. But it's rooted in scripture and it's this. We're not here to make excuses for sinners. Y'all hear that clear? We're not here to make excuses for sinners. But we are here to make a home for them. We're here to make a home. And so if you are that filthy, rotten, unlovable, hungry, depleted, lost, prisoner of sin. Welcome home in Jesus name. Welcome home. Welcome home. And it is based upon the scripture and this is what the Lord put on my heart to share with you in Luke 5. Jesus said healthy people do not need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. This is why we give the gospel every week, by the way, because we want to give people an opportunity to step in to a place called home into the family of God. You see, our mission here at Grace Point Church, I can't speak for any other church, but I will tell you, we put it on a wall and we want to aspire towards that, and that is to lead common people, common people, into uncommon life in Jesus. And so if you've got dirt under your fingernails, welcome home. We don't care where you put the remote control here. We just want you to meet the head of the household and experience his love. It's based on this fact. You see, all of us are sinners, scripture says. We all were born. We all fall, fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, have we forgotten grace point? Yet God in his grace freely made us right in his sight. And he did this through Christ Jesus who freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life by shedding his blood. Don't miss this. The sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who deserved to be punished for their sins in times past for he was looking ahead and he was including them in what he would do in this present time. 
God did this to demonstrate his righteousness for he himself is fair and just and he makes sinners like me, David Martin, your pastor. I've been made right in his sight because I've trusted in Jesus. I repented. I was a sinner. I'm saved and I'm inviting you to get saved. Welcome home. You have a place in the kingdom of God because of what I just shared with you. You have a place. Would you please stand to your feet? What other response can we have in light of Matthew, where Jesus says, when I was hungry, sick, destitute, forgotten, in prison, sick, all these things, what other response could we have when we realized that we showed up to the Father the same way that this young man had? And we were given a robe of righteousness. Jesus exchanged his status as the son and gave us the rights to be welcomed into the home. And he says, I will become unclean. I will become a sinner. I will become separate from the Father so that you could be clothed. I will become naked. I will become hungry. I will become despondent. I will become the prisoner so that you become the son welcomed home. Welcome home. So if you want to receive Jesus or maybe rededicate your life this morning, you have an opportunity. It's time to repent. Pray with me right now. Ask the Father, he's listening, in Jesus' name, pray with me, in Jesus' name, I come to you and I confess that I'm a sinner. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, Jesus. I believe you rose from the dead on the third day and I'm asking you to save me and welcome me home. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and I make you the Lord and boss of my life. In Jesus' name. And scripture says that anybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so if you just prayed that prayer right now and you meant that from the bottom of your heart, I wanna be the first to congratulate you. Welcome home into the family of God. But if you just prayed this, if heaven celebrates someone who returns to God or is found by God, I think we should celebrate too. So if you prayed that, put your hand up. One, two, three, just stick your hand up. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Who else? Yes. Yes. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on. Don't be timid. Don't be timid. Anybody online? God bless you guys. We'll get into your part, but this is the baseline. Who in your life needs to be fed and served and reached and pursued? Because the rescuers... Those who have been rescued make the best rescuers. If you've been rescued, begin to pray, God, who in my life needs to be welcomed into the family of God? It's time. The world needs Jesus, guys. And you have him, and you know the way to the Father. So do it and share it and invite them here. And I promise you, we will make them feel at home. In Jesus' name. Y'all right? Y'all good? Man, I love you guys. I love you guys. Come back tonight for our time of worship and ministry time. We just worship here at 6 o'clock. Come in the room. We just sing songs to Jesus and pray for one another. It's absolutely a treat. You're invited. God bless you. We will see you next week. Y'all be good.